Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our December 7th Community Coalition Conversation. I'm Violet Haldane, a member of the coalition, which is made up of 13 organizations in the greater Hartford area. Um, our topic for tonight is migrating students to the US. And we have three guests um, from the Hartford School District. We have uh, Ms. Judith Fagan from the Welcome Center, Sherry Davis Gould, well, she's Acting Chief Operating Officer, and Principal Glennis Richardson, who's the Principal of Weaver High. And um, I'm going to begin by asking the young ladies to give us a little bit about their background and to let us know what their role is in the school system. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Fagan. And you're muted. Hi, good evening. Um, good evening. My name is Judith Fagan. Um, I am the director of the Welcome Center. Prior to that, I was the family advocate for Hartford Public Schools. Um, the Welcome Center um, is, was created um, as a hub for parents to come for information, um, to voice concerns or complaints. And um, so we're able to help them to navigate through the school system. Most, it is now joined with the, um, the Choice Enrollment Center. So we're in one space where it is a one, a one stop shop for parents to come to enroll their children and to get information. Thank you. I have been in the Hartford School District for a long time, and I do live in Hartford, so I have a vested interest in the community. Okay, and uh, can you tell us where the Welcome Center is located? It's located at 330 Weathersfield Avenue, and that's oh. in the south end of Hartford. Um, we're now in the same building as Buckley High School. It's being renovated. And that's where the Board of Education is now. So we are a part of central office. Okay, thank you. Ms. Um, Ms. Sherry Davis Good. How do you pronounce your last name? Good. Sherry Good. Davis Good, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Davis Good. I am the Acting Chief Operating Officer for Hartford Public Schools. Um, that is uh, actually a recent uh, position for me. Prior to that, I served as the executive director of en the Office of Enrollment and School Choice. So that is, I am pleased to be here tonight um, to share with you an overview of the registration process for all the students entering um, Hartford Public Schools. Nice to meet you all. Okay, thank you. And where are you located? I'm actually located, we're all at Central Office at the 330 Weathersfield Avenue. Um, the, the Welcome Center is actually on the first floor of the building and um, the rest of Central Office is located on the fourth floor. Okay, so no one is at Capital Community College no, location anymore. 960 Main Street is, is no longer our house. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and Ms. Richardson, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role? Yes, ma'am. So uh, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Glennis Richardson, and my role is um, an executive principal of the Weaver campus. And what that means is that I have full um, administrative oversight of Weaver, the principal of Weaver, but it also means that I have um, some degree of oversight for Kinsella Magnet High School um, in the area of operations because the Magnet School is co-located on the Weaver campus. And and so prior to coming to Hartford, um, this is my second year in the role. And prior to coming to Hartford, I was working with um, an organization um, that focused on um, school leadership development. And so I was working with that organization, working with schools nationally across the country. So thank you for um, opening up your space um, for us to be with you this evening. Okay, and thank you um, for agreeing to come and talk about this subject. 
Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, as to why this topic is so important to us. Um, and it's a continuation of a discussion that we've been having. In spring of 2019, the West Indian Foundation asked Trinity College if they would consider um, our request to explore the placement of migrant students in the Hartford and Bloomfield school systems through their Action Lab program. Um, this was called Student Success is what they named it. And the Action Lab um, team of students from Trinity and Capital Community College, um, they decided to take on this program. And they explored how the local public schools integrate West Indian children and their families into the educational system. Given that most migrant programs are geared towards Latino students whose, whose needs may differ from English speaking West Indian students. The Action Lab team collaborated with the foundation to interview Hartford school administrators responsible for enrolling newly arriving students. They examined the school district's welcome center for new families and they conducted surveys of parents who emigrated from the West Indies. Their findings focused on structural and cultural differences between the West Indian and U.S. schools, as well as barriers to services commonly needed by West Indian families. Um, they did provide recommendations that were made and shared. And um, I did put a link to the study in the chat room. And if you cannot see it, I can um, re-put it there again. And so um, as we go through this dialogue this evening, um, we would like to, you know, I do have, um, we would just like to see where we currently are with this. And the objectives of this program this evening is to talk about the students to migrating, that are migrating to the U.S. How does that look in Hartford and what can you tell us about those students that you encounter? Um, student placement in the schools, how are the students placed and what support is there for student success? So um, those are the things we will be exploring this evening. And so I think um, first up, it's going to be um, Ms. Fagan. I think you will be able to tell us what options are available to the students migrating to the U.S. And um, can you share that with us? And whatever you can tell us about the population as it currently exists today in the school system. So I interface with families that come to the Welcome Center who has questions um, regarding the enrollment process, regarding I myself, I'm Jamaican and experienced coming here to the United States and um, assimilating in the public school system. I'm a graduate of Weaver High School. So, um, so parents who come to the Welcome Center um, from the um, Caribbean or the West Indies, and if they come to the Welcome Center, we, um, we help them and explain the process and then they are referred to the enrollment center. They go through the registration process there uh, and Sherry can um, say, talk more about this process when they go to the enrollment center and they um, have to provide, you know, their proof of address, um, updated immunization and health records like any other students. Now, some of the students that come in, it depend on what grade they're coming into, um, that they will be placed and if there are records available from the sending school in Jamaica, those records are also are forwarded to the school and they're reviewed. And, um, and basically if, if parent has questions about the schools and, um, you know, what's available to them, the supports in schools, um, depending on whether um, they're coming also from a rural or a city, um, you know, high school in, in, this, in an urban area, that also makes a difference. I've seen that over the years, 
um, but they're normally placed by their, um, by their age um, in school. If they come with um, a, a, a transcript from Jamaica that gives more information about their placement, then um, they're placed as such. But the, in, in terms of the enrollment process, um, Sherry can talk more about that part. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sherry, could you um, please talk to us about the placement and the enrollment process? Yes. And I think um, it will also be helpful, Judith, as to when we get to the parts where um, we need clarification sometimes for families, that we talk about how we work collaboratively to support the family. So I'm, I'm going to just share um, my screen just for a moment. Um, to walk through um, the technical process of registering a student in school, and then we can dive into additional questions around what that may look like for a student migrating here from um, the West Indies. So um, to start, we, we, we look at um, who is the guardian of the parent, I mean of the student, so we, um, ask the parent or guardian to provide um, their driver's license, their birth certificate. And sometimes we get families that come to us um, from DCF. So proof of guardianship is just ensuring that we're um, registering a student who is um, a part of, of the family that's being presented to us. Um, and here um, is one of the places where we know when we have students migrating um, to us, um, that we sometimes it's not the, the guardian that um, the parent or the the, the parent or um, the family member may still be located in the West Indies and they've sent their child over to um, the states. And so then we have a process in which we work with the family to establish guardianship. Um, whether that be, um, for instance, recently we had an aunt who is now um, the custodian of the, the student, the guardian of the student. And so we either work with the, the, the aunt or the family member to share with them that they could go to the probate office um, for the city to establish guardianship, which we think is is best because when, if there is an emergency and God forbid there's an emergency medical si situation, that that person then has the opportunity to, um, you know, make a important decision for that student that only a guardian in most cases can make. Um, Judith, would you like to add anything to that piece? You're muted, Judith. Yeah, that pretty much sums up that um, the, the enrollment process. Now, um, parents, if they're new to the city, they may have questions about, you know, what's available in the community, um, what's available in school. Um, say if, you know, there are some students that may come that are a little behind, they will ask what's available for, you know, academic um, support in the schools. Um, oh, and Judith, I'm sorry, I think I, I think I may have confused you. I wanted to see if you wanted to add to the proof of guardianship piece. I was oh, sharing. The, oh, the proof of guardianship. Oh, okay. So um, yes, I think you pretty much summed it up, um, Sherry, in terms of you know, there are some students that may come to a relative and they have to go as part of that process that Sherry just talked about. Um, and either going to probate. Um, some may come up with um, a, a notarized um, letter or some sort of legal document from Jamaica given the person here, um, you know, you know, a right to be their guardian or be, you know, have guardianship of the student. 
until they come or, or, or whatever the case may be. And I think those types of documents are also acceptable, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But aside from that, um, I know during certain, um, like during the hurricane or something when students came up here because for some reason, you know, for, for emergency reasons, they may come without that kind of document. And in those cases, they're referred to the probate court. Thank you, Judith. Um, the next document that's required is the proof of age, uh, which is generally um, the birth certificate or a passport. In some cases, when families don't have either one of those, we can um, take the information from the immunization records. Next is the proof of residency. Uh, we look at this information from a primary document or, or two, one primary document or the family can provide two of the secondary documents. So as we know, when you move into um, the state in a city, the city where you reside is responsible to educate um, the student. And so proof of residency by state law is um, how we determine that we are res responsible for the child's education. So again, we, um, if the family can provide one primary, it could be the um, lease agreement, a mortgage payment, or a current utility bill, electric gas, or the water bill. And if for whatever reason, these documents are not in your name or what have you, then we also take um, a cable bill or a phone bill, a paid stub, or a proof of government benefits. And here again, when we talk about a proof of residency, with the um, if the student is living with the relative or the parent, the parent of the student is living with the relative, then what we have is um, what we can use to establish residency is the certification of residency form. This form attests from the family who is the resident of Harford that the family indeed is residing with them. And then that person then provides us with the um, documents um, that are required for to establish residency to enroll in schools. And I'm gonna go to the proof of grade, but we can certainly double back after and answer any questions you may have about these proof documents. The proof of grade document is not required at the time of registration, but what it does do is help us make sure that as soon as we register the student and share the information with the school, that the student's um, schedule will begin to be developed at the school level. So we really, really want um, families to come to us, um, especially in grades kindergarten through eight. We hope that they have um, a report card or the latest report card or progress report or a transcript or latest report card from whatever school they're exiting from. Now, I know we're going to double back to one of our um, um, discussions we want to have regarding the proof of grade, but I wanted to pause here for a second to see if there was any questions around these requirements. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Hi, this is Angela. I was just, um, I know you, for the sake of time, wanted to go through, but I think it's really important for people to understand that McKinney-Vento Homeless um, Assistance Act is critical right now as we approach during this pandemic, the deadline for a lot of the uh, rental and mortgage support programs, and you know, people might be facing eviction, and folks yes. need to know that that you know there are some protections in in terms of kids being able to yes to that's enroll, that's absolutely what i was um, going to regardless gonna... of their um residency understood um that was definitely one of the um areas we were going to um discuss further and so again when a family is unable to provide us with the proof of residency 
This is Wendy, Office of Enrollment and School Choice and um, Judith's team. We work collaboratively together uh, to take the next step. So that family, once they're unable um, or shares with us that they don't have those documents, we um, ask them to go consult with um, Judith's team. And Judith, if you wanna walk, uh, walk us through that process. Yes, so, um... So in the Welcome Center is the homeless liaison. She is the homeless program assistant. And when parents are not able to provide the documents required for registration, um, they then would qualify. We ask the pertinent questions to qualify them under the McKinney Vental Act because we want those students to be in school. Um, so under the McKinney Vental Act, the that program assistant can act and sign off as a guardian and um, it bypasses all of the requirements um, that is needed um, the to register under regular registration and so that student can be registered it, it's the mckinney act basically removed barriers for students to be able to register and be in school um, so that's when we collaborate and um, the homeless um, assistant is Leslie Carrillo. She works in our office and, um, and she then would qualify the student and, and the student, her name would be um, put in place of a, a guardian or the parent or the guardian. And um, she then, in turn, we assist those families to, to register and, and help support them and make sure that the school knows that they're coming um, in terms of the social worker in the school and, and those staff. Um, thank you. Um, we did get a question regarding placement. And the question was, uh, what is the process for evaluating the school transcript from another country? Okay, so that's a, a great segue to the one, the next point we wanted to um, make sure that we shared. And that was the proof of grade. One of, um, one of the challenges we've had is that in some cases, Students who are coming from the West Indies have al already graduated from high school. And that, that transcript evaluation happens after they registered with us. So I'm just gonna walk through the process. A student comes in, they're registered. We ask for the proof of grade, which is either a transcript or a latest report card. Sometimes our families have that document and sometimes they don't. In some cases, what's happening is when we register the student and um, for an example, they get placed at Weaver High School um, and maybe quickly I'll talk about how we place students. So we have four zones in Hartford in the Hartford Public Schools District and based on the student's address, we determine which zone that they reside in and then we look for the available seat closest to that student's home in a school that doesn't have um, an enrollment accommodation, meaning that if in a certain zone, they live closest to a magnet school, well, we know that magnet school has enrollment guidelines that students are placed in that school during the lottery process. So if a student comes in, um, they're not automatically placed in a magnet school, they'll be placed in a district school that's closest to their home. So that's what I meant by our enrollment requirement. So student comes in, we decide which zone, and then we look for the district school closest to their home with an available seat. So I'm gonna double back to my um, example of um, a high school student coming into zone one or two which would um, identify their high school as Weaver High School. Sometimes what has happened is that the student has graduated. We don't learn that information until 
the school has obtained the transcript information from um, the, the, the country where they're coming from. And so we kind of just want to touch on that tonight to make sure that you all understand um, the options for students who've ar already graduated from high school. We certainly want to support them, but we don't want them necessarily having to redo um, some part of high school. So I'm gonna um, turn it over to Principal Richardson and have her share with you um, that question around how transcripts are evaluated and talk a little more about uh, what I just shared. So um, Weber High School has a very large um, representation of students that come from um, the Caribbean, Caribbean, uh, the West Indies. Um, we are about, um, I would say, approximately close to about a third of our population. And so when we receive a student, um, the first thing that we go by is we go by the information that is sent to us by um, the Office of Enrollment. And that's what is used to provide the student with a schedule. So as uh, Sherry um, alluded to earlier, when we receive the transcripts late, then what happens is, or after enrollment, but what we call late is after enrollment. And the reason why we call it late is because we know that we're scheduling a student, but we're scheduling a student blind. We want the student to be in class. We want the student to be in an environment where the student is receiving academic and social supports. But we also know that we have a blind spot, which means that we have to question if the program that we have in place now is really the best and appropriate program for the student. So when the transcript arrives, the school counselors do a credit evaluation. And we are fortunate at our school to have um, one of our counselors who actually is, um, whose family comes from Jamaica. And so she's very familiar with Jamaican transcripts and, and how they read. And so oftentimes what we find when the transcript arrives after the student has been enrolled is that we have to go back and do what we call some cleaning, meaning that um, we need to change a course or the student doesn't need this course, the student needs that course. And so there is um, oftentimes there is time loss and, and missed opportunity that really is a disservice um, to our students. Um, one of those, I think one of the biggest disservices that we have to our students is uh, when they arrive and they're enrolled in school and we come to find out later that they've already completed high school in Jamaica. And so we just had um, a, a two recent cases of that and, and that seems to be a growing trend. And so um, the reason why we call it a disservice is because we want to provide students with the best opportunities possible. And we have partnerships with UHART, we have partnerships with Capital Community, and there are a number of options that we can uh, provide for students students rather than have them complete another year of high school. We can um, be very creative with what we can offer. And so, um, for example, one of the students that most recently we discovered, um, her father um, reported that he was just under the impression that this is what he needed to do. And so when he realized that, oh, this is not what I need to do, you know, we brought him in, brought the student in, uh, set them down. We called our contacts over at Capital Community. We set up a transition program for the student. And now the student is scheduled to start uh, her uh, nursing uh, pathway in education in January at Capital community. And so, you know, the father was happy, the student was happy, we were able to, you know, facilitate that transition. And those are the types of, uh, of placements that really, you know, as, uh, as the building leader, uh, really make my heart kind of sing because it's like the student is happy, she's crying, she's excited, we're crying, we're excited, because now you can really start this journey towards being a nurse, you know, and, and not have to delay it for another year by coming to high school. And so it is very important as students are migrating into the U.S. and, and especially into Harvard, so specifically into Harvard Public Schools, that for 9 through 12, that transcript is almost like gold. You know, it is, it is, it is the document that is needed 
to make sure that we are providing the most accurate and comprehensive education that the student needs. And so I just wanted to um, just, just emphasize that. Are there any more questions around the transcripts? Hello, uh, Dr. Garcia Blocker, you joined us. Thank you. Um, around the, the placement, I know that um, we said initially that it was based on the student's age. Mm -hmm. So the first criteria is their age. So if they're... I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Haldane. I wouldn't say that their age. Our primary... Um, tool to understand what grade a student should be in is um, what their prior school said their grade they were entering or leaving from. We don't just, you know, so if the age on the, that's why we want the proof of record, proof of age and uh, proof of, what am I calling it? The proof of grade, right? We rely on a proof of grade from the sending school to tell us what grade we should continue the student in. It, in the absence of that, we will rely on the we will rely on the age until the information is received from the um, sending district. So it's it's age at the school level. We also use um, the parents' account and the students' account, and that's considered um, as well until we get the official transcript from the exiting school. Okay, um, I, I'm going to. One of the questions I really want to ask is because this whole thing started back because I I work with a lot of students, and. The students were beginning to say, one student said they got left back, and then suddenly three students said that they, when they came, they were put in a, a grade. And so we were finding these students who were, in their minds, put back because they're older than their peers when they came to America. And so um, one of the recommendations that was given was that the students be tested because we know that all schools are not equal, um, even in America, and looking at a transcript does not necessarily mean that, um, you know, the rigors of one school is the same as the rigors of another school. And one of our recommendations was that students be tested to see what they know and where they are versus looking at their age or um, even if you look at the transcript is, can you really do a good evaluation of their transcript? And so, because it's, there is a perception, I'm gonna say it's a perception, um, that students get put back when they come to the States. And how do you um, determine if a student is behind academically versus their age for placement? Okay. So I heard you ask a couple of questions there. I'm gonna to try to address them all and then I'll defer to uh, Sherry. I see that Dr. Garcia Blocker just joined us and they may be able to chime in. So the evaluation of the transcript is, is pretty accurate. Um, it is done um, at the school level. And when there are questions at the school level, then we go to the district level. So we will go to Dr. Garcia Blocker's team and we will get the district counselor to double check or to cross check, right? To confirm that, that this class equals this class here and that class equals that class here and be able to do what we call a correct credit evaluation. Um, what is, is could possibly, what the students could possibly be experiencing when they talk about um, having to be set back um, might be the, the, the impact of receiving a, um, a transcript um, after the student has been enrolled and then having the new information and, and cross-checking the actual courses that the student needs to be to graduate from high school in the state of Connecticut uh, against what that transcript says. Now, as far as a placement test, uh, a placement test is not available in grades 9 through 12. 
So there's no instrument that I can give the student or any student to, to say, you know, for the student to demonstrate his or her aptitude in a particular subject area. And so basically in order to really get a good understanding about where a student is academically and socially, it's going to take time for us to see how the student is uh, performing, how the student is transitioning, what the needs are. And at Weaver, our students are pretty receptive to new students coming in. So when before COVID, when all of the students were there, it was very easy for us to identify a new a student, uh, especially a student that had come from Jamaica or the West Indies or Caribbean Island because they own like, own their uh, their uh, the community right they own the community so the students are very uh, protective and welcoming and they help the students get acclimated to the school and most recently they will also help to advocate for um, what might be missing on the schedule what they think the student might not be communicating correctly and granted that is still a, an evolving process for us but um it is uh, a process nonetheless. And so uh, we have to get our information from what the student demonstrates when they arrive, as well as the transcript that comes from the exiting school. So at Weaver, we use a combination of both because the, the transcript is the historical record. And, and, and even though it might be a recent history, it is a history nonetheless. And so we use that to actually place initial placement. And then as the student is in classes, we have made additional placements. We have moved students from a regular level class to an honors class or even an AP class uh, based upon what the student has demonstrated when they actually arrive. And so it's a number of things and, it, the, and, and the actual specific service for a student it is it's oftentimes very much individualized for the student once the student arrives. But I hear what you're saying about a placement test. It's just we don't have one. They do have one for younger students because these were kids in the middle school. Oh, I don't know about that. You have to share. Do we have one for... Um... Uh, I actually... So what I think I would ask for, because I don't think I've experienced that, um, generally, if a family shares a concern around the grade, it usually goes to the principal and it may not come back to us. Um, so, Ms. Haldane, if there is any time where um, there is a question around the, the, the uh, placement of the grade for a student, um, I would ask that you please have that family either reach out to the principal to share their concern, or they can certainly reach out to my office to share it with me. Um, because I personally have not dealt with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, you said that Ms. Garcia Blocker joined us. Um, could she please introduce herself and tell us what her role is in the school system? Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Garcia Blocker, I'm executive director of uh, post-secondary success and alternative programming. I'm year two. I just put my information into the chat. I'm year two uh, in the system. Last year, um, I had oversight of the comprehensive high schools uh, and Kinsella. And so uh, my role is really to uh, work with all parties to ensure that all of our young people graduate from high school, college, and career ready. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple questions. Um, and some of them are based on the recommendations and then some of them have come through um, to me. So is there a mentoring or a buddy program for students, a newly arriving student, and they go into a school? Is there um, any kind of I'm gonna say formalized buddy system so that they have someone in the school that can kind of show them the ropes. So at, at Weaver, we, we have one. 
um, not just for our um, students that are coming from the West Indies, but we also have a large population of Hispanic um, speaking students as well, you know, uh, Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking students, Hispanic students and the Latinx. And so um, that has come to work for us. It, and so we have the system that when the student arrives, then there are uh, students that this student is placed with. Um, most of the time, the student already knows who the student wants to be placed with. Um, but if the student doesn't know, then there's a placement that is facilitated amongst our ESOL teachers, gen ed teachers, social workers, and school counselors. Okay. Um, do we yeah. add something to that, please? Sure. So we're, we are about to uh, launch an, an alumni mentoring program in the district at our three comprehensive high schools. We're starting this spring with a pilot, um, starting with um, alumni who are employees of the district. And then over the summer, we're going to broaden that to alumni who uh, you know, live locally or want to mentor students. And so you raise a good point that um, I will work with uh, Nushet on. And that is, you know, a, a, there is a niche group, you know, new arrivals. I don't care, you know, where they're coming from, but, you know, could potentially want a mentor, an adult alumni mentor, who is also familiar with that whole process of being brand new and, and uh, the family also could potentially use support. So thank you for the suggestion, the question, because it, it, raises another way for us to look at alumni mentoring. Okay. Also mentoring or support for the parents for um, especially if it's a family unit that is newly arrived. Is there any type of program there? Can I um, um so in every school, there is a family and community service support provider um, that are staffed in the schools for parents. Um, so those staff are, you know, would reach out to families um, for extra help. They, they're the staff that can do home visits um, and they're the go-to person in the school for parents to call. Um, there is there is not a program specific, I believe, to West Indian parents per se. And also, previously in the 90s, they had what we call a West Indian arrival program that was specific for new students coming from the West Indian Caribbean. But that program um, was, I think, defunded at some point. Or uh, and and maybe I think you're talking something along that line. Um, but there's not a program like that currently running in the district. However, um, parents who need help, they, they, that's why the Welcome Center is also there for parents to come or, or call if they need assistance, if, but they need to be aware of it also. Is the Welcome Center only off, what are the hours of the Welcome Center? Eight to four. So, no evening hours in case you work well we have you know engagement activities especially pre-covid um we have you know we have um parent engagement activities that parents can come those are after school hours however during the covid season we don't have those activities um um ex you know except through zoom we have a lot of trainings for parents where parents can learn more about what their children are learning in school. Um, we have um, an engagement um, that we call Hopes and Dreams, where parents can come and talk about, you know, what is their dream for their hope and dream for their children? What do they see their children doing um, in Harper Public Schools or in the, in the future? What their children are learning in school um, and, and those sort of things. We even, even for families who um, may need some adult education themselves or need some referral to other places in the community that can help them, um, we're able to help them in, in, in those areas. 
Okay. Um, and Ms. Haldane, yes. um, I'm sorry that I have not been able to <laughs> keep my camera on most of the meeting. Um, okay. But hello, good evening, everyone. Michelle mm -hmm. Blackburg. And Judith did mention our family and community service support providers. And just wanted to add that um, given where we are right now, many of our FCSSPs, as we call them, they are adjusting hours to respond to the needs of families. So as she mentioned that, yes, they are available in the schools and we definitely encourage parents to reach out to them. And we also encourage our FCSSPs to reach out to families. But just wanted to add that piece that we are working with FCSSPs to adjust hours to meet the needs of families, um, of course, you know, case by case, but just wanted to add that piece and all the things that Judith mentioned of how they support families, how they work with families, but doing that um, sometimes now, having to do that in the evening based on um, the needs of the family. So just wanted to add that piece. Okay. Um, we, we briefly mentioned the newly arrival program and that was created a while back. And I think one of the reasons it was created was the, I'm gonna say the perception that West Indian students, when they did come to the country that they were being placed back or they were not being placed correctly or they, they I'm gonna say maybe they needed some extra help. And at some point it was determined that um, it was no longer needed. Everyone had been integrated and assimilated. If we find that there is a need, for such a program to come back, how would the community or go about engaging the school system? I think I can, and I think the, um, probably the most prudent way would be to, um, Start with um, Ms. Black Burke. Okay. Um, as she is our Chief of Family Engagement and Partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the best, the best mechanism to um, uh, get that need met. Okay. Thank you. Um, when the, when Trinity did the outreach, one of the things that came back was that, um, I guess on the one of the forms, it considers Patois um, a, a language versus a dialect. And um, I guess the school system counts the number of Patois speaking in the school district. And um, I think one of the things is because parents do not consider it a different language. Um, they do not complete that box or you know that option and I guess the question is why is that collected and when it's collected how how is that information used I can I can respond to that so um, when families come to the district they are administered the home language survey which is an instrument that is required by the state of Connecticut and it allows us to determine if the student may need um, language support services. And so there are three questions um, on the survey um, that determines um, the primary language of the student, the language they speak at home, and um, any secondary language they may also speak. If one of those the answer to one of those questions is non-English, then it triggers a um, request to our um, Office of Language, I think I'm calling their office name incorrectly. Um, I think it's, it's the English Language Learner Support Office. And what they will do is, um, follow up with the family to determine if the student should be tested and they're given a language assessment test and that helps us determine if they should continue to receive services um, in English. So we're saying that the students from the West Indies, if they speak Patwa, that's not considered English. So they might have to get 
English. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm Miss Haldane, I'm really going to follow up on that because I don't think that's necessarily the case when we see Patois on the language survey. So okay. I'm going to follow up with that. But again, mainly if a student's primary language is non-English, right? And like you're saying, uh, Patois is a dialect of English. So we're going with non-English. Then those families, uh, that those students are given an assessment to determine if they need um, additional assistance in, in um, obtaining the English language. So I don't believe, and, and I will definitely double check um, with Daisy Torres, who oversees that work for the district, to make sure that that is not happening, but I'm, I'm almost certain it isn't. Okay. What's the difference between English, English language learner services and standard English language services? So I don't, I don't I'm not familiar with the term standard, right? But the, um, the English, um, our, I'm sorry. Our um, language department provides services to students, right? Uh, whether it's pull-in, where if it's a, a student who speaks mainly English, I mean mainly Spanish, they are able to receive services um, from a tutor perhaps to help support their English attainment, or they're actually in a classroom that is taught um, in English and in Spanish. So that is the model that supports language acquisition in a district. And so I don't think there's any difference except um, I'm not sure where that second term um, you named is coming from. Do you okay. mind sharing it again? Um, standard English language services. Yeah, I think um, what she's referring to, Sherry, is not necessarily specific to Hartford, but it is a term that's used to distinguish where a student is in their language acquisition. So if a student is new to, um, let's say a Spanish speaking student is new to the um, United uh, States um, or, or Hartford, and mm -hmm. they need to have um, English language services support because they speak very minimal English. Well, at a certain point, they would learn the language. And then once they learn the language, they would then transition to another phase of language acquisition, which would be the standardization of it. So how to now get better with the language that you have learned. And that's how it's used in other places. Um, but mm -hmm. as Sherry stated, it's not necessarily in the Hartford model. Yeah, and I actually think we consider that stage where we consider that transitional, transitional language services. So that's probably the equivalent in Harford that it's, it's, it's called transitional. Okay. Um, does the Harford school system have any concerns um, or see any trends in regards to the students coming from the West Indies? Um, how are they doing? How are they acclimating? Um, you know, just in general. Are they being successful? Um, are they struggling? Are they assimilating? Um, well, I can speak for this for uh, a subset of students, the students that are at Weaver. I don't necessarily see um, a, a, a differentiated, I guess, uh, need that might be just related to students from the Caribbean or, or West Indies. Like if a student is struggling in a particular area, they're going to be different types of students. They're going to struggle with that particular area. So there's nothing that is specific to uh, coming um, into the school for a Caribbean student or, or West Indian student, right, once they get in. If I could say a trend that I experienced as um, at Weaver High School is, is really the trend around 
the, the transcripts that we talked about earlier. And so if I could offer a, a, a recommendation or even a plea to, to, to this uh, community is to uh, 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 try to you know, help and support parents either by messaging or communication, that it is very, very important that we have that document, that we're going to use that document to determine what is the best possible program for the student that is migrating into Hartford Public Schools. And so that would be the trend. You know, um, you know, our students from the Caribbean and the West Indies, they, um, many of them are doing well, you know, and some of them are not doing well, but I have um, students that are Latino uh, and Latinx that are not doing well. I have students that are non-Caribbean and non-West Indies and they're not doing well, unfortunately, and so forth and so on. So there is no, you know, no identifier specific. Um, we just want to make sure that when students come in, that they come in with the documents that are going to uh, set them up for uh, as much success as possible and put us uh, at the district and the school level in the best possible position to make sure that we are servicing them in a way that they deserve to be serviced. And that's the best way possible. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, this I is think also, just a follow-up question to that um, for the school staff. <laughs> Does the Hartford public school system do any racial, ethnic, linguistic tracking of data at all um, as, as it relates to advancement, education, just overall tracking? Is that done at all? Well, I'm gonna let Cher respond at the district level, but at the school level it is, but there's no tracking system specifically for students from the West Indians or the Caribbean population. So I can tell you about black students, right? I can tell you about students that are black and students that are Latino and students that are white and students that identify as other, but, I, but there is no data um, that we collect um, specifically for the demographic of students that come from the Caribbean and West Indies. And hey. that is, that is um, the case at the district level. I do know in some cases, there is some data points that look at country of origin, um, but it, has, it doesn't track back to academic success. Okay. So that might be something we might want to look at also. Um, Ms. Haldane, um, Mr. I'm going to say Errol. Errol, yeah, I was Errol. going to get to <laughs> Okay. Errol, are you muted? I, I am now. Okay. Um, my, my question, hi, I'm feeling, hi everyone. My question was to um, Dr. Um, Garcia Blocker in terms of um, the uh, post-secondary success. What exactly does that entail? Is it, is it just to get students who are graduating from uh, high school ready and prepared for college? And what exactly does your, your, um, your program entail to make sure? And uh, also, do you track students once they leave the public school system and attend colleges to see what the graduation rate is? So I'm new to this role in Hartford. I've done this work uh, in New Haven. And so I'm trying to get my feet wet to figure out, you know, how things are done in, in, in Hartford. But uh, what this entails is not just about uh, working with seniors and, and making sure they go on to the next step. It's working with the students all the way through middle school into high school, ensuring that they have the academic supports that they need to be successful in high school, to earn the requisite credits, to move on and graduate from high school in four years. But not only to graduate from high school in four years, is to graduate from high school in four years and have an actual viable plan that they can execute. Um, so all students are not going to go to college, but all students absolutely need to be prepared to go to college should that be the option that they want to pursue. Even if they don't go to two or four year colleges, most places require some kind of post-secondary uh, certification, learning. So even if they do go into a pre-apprenticeship program, 
They're still going to be reading and writing and math assessments that they're going to have to do and pass in order to be successful there. Now, there are tracking mechanisms that um, we do use. The National Student Clearinghouse will track the students who enroll in college um, and uh, persist to the second year and then actually indeed graduate uh, from college. So that data does lag back a year or so. Um, so we don't have data, as you can imagine, for the class of 2020, because they are just enrolling um, in school uh, right now. The harder thing to track are obviously are the students who go on to the military or the students that go on to work, because in order to track that kind of data, you need social security numbers to see who's earning salaries and paying, you know, paying into the, to, you know, paying social security and into the tax system. So it is a, it, it, it's a comprehensive job. It requires working with multiple people uh, from throughout the district uh, and in the community. But the goal, as I've said, is to ensure that our students graduate from high school uh, ready to go on uh, to pursue uh, viable careers after high school. Thank you. I don't know if you had a follow-up question to that. No, I was just kind of curious. I know, I know it's, um, it's one of the things, I mean, I'm myself, I graduated from Weaver High School and um, just in terms of tracking it, you, I mean, you mentioned it's, it's a work in progress in terms of getting your feet wet and, and, and track the, the students. And, and so I'm just curious as, as to the percentage of Hartford Public Schools kids uh, in the lab that, that, that obtain a four-year degree or a two-year degree. If there's, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you guys have data on, on, on that. Oh yeah, that data, that data is available. That data we track uh, through the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, but what we don't, I mean, that's college data. Um, mm. But there are a whole lot of other ways young people leave this school system and become successful uh -huh. that don't get captured in that way. And, you know, those who, like I said, who go on to the military and have successful careers in the military or go on and start their own businesses or go on into a plumbing pre-apprenticeship program or an HVAC pre-apprenticeship, unfortunately, is not captured. Mm -hmm just the just the the national student clearinghouse data that shows who went on to college do you know what well, the data piece of the information do you know what the latest um data is in terms of uh say for for Harvard public schools school well that's what i would have to look at but i can tell you right now for the class of 2020 and this is all self-reported data um close to 40% of the, like 38% of the students, unfortunately, graduated with unknown plans. Um, we don't know what their plans are uh, or were. Um, and then we had a number of students, close to 40% uh, percent who said uh, their plan was to go to college. Now saying you're going to go to college and actually ending up in college in September are two different things. And so that's why the National Student Clearinghouse data is important because it actually tracks enrollment in, in, in a college uh, or institution of higher learning and tracks them through, you know, so we do have a number of kids who go on to college, but the real uh, important data point is how many of those students persist to sophomore year because there are a lot of students who go to college but don't make it to sophomore year for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's good information. I know we're running a little bit over and there were just two questions. Uh, one is, is there any coordination between um, the school system and any of the islands to try to get the transcript or is that solely dependent on parents or the guardians to provide that? Oh no, absolutely. Each, um, we will try at the time of registration as well. So there is a, a standardized form where we capture the information of where the student is coming from. Mm -hmm. And then that, that information is then faxed to um, the, the rescinding district. 
If we don't get it in our office in a timely manner, then that, that information that is captured on where the student is coming from is sent to the school, and then they do their um, work of getting the information from um, the, the school prior. Okay, even if it's out the country? Oh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and then um, the last question is, how are our students doing in the transition from third to fourth grade? Um, that population, they say that fourth grade is like the magic grade, um, you know, where people begin to make predictions. So how are our students faring at being grade level and reading, you know, ready, reading at grade level? So that, that information would come from our Office of Academics. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to um, share what I think I know. I prefer to gather the information and I will share it. Um, Nushet or I will get back to you um, to give you that um, report out on um, that, that transition from grade three to four. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep, thank you. Yeah, or even better yet, maybe that's a group that needs to have a meeting similar to here because, you know, once you share that data point, then come a whole lot of other questions that you're not going to be able to answer. So, okay, we'll take yeah. that under advisement. We'll have a, t a new topic <laughs> yep. for our next meeting. And Ms. Hal yes. And Ms. Haldane. Yes. Um, if I could just um, interject here and also state that on our website under um, the Office of Academics, you can also get to it through our distance learning. We have put up additional tools, um, content guides for families, learning guides for families. So, you know, while we are exploring the actual answer, the data point, just always want to leave families with tools and resources to help support their third and their fourth graders. Um, so just wanted to add that piece. Um, last week, we actually had a family learning session that was dedicated to K-5 literacy. So um, it's out there on our website, and I can definitely send the links to you, um, Ms. Haldane, that you can share more widely. We will distribute it. Um, I thank everyone. We've got a lot of information. I think we learned a lot. I think... Um, you know, we're kind of reassured and the group will get back and we will reach out to Ms. Black Burke um, with additional questions or, you know, whatever we feel that we may need to share and as to how we can support the school system and our students. And I really would like to thank everyone for coming and answering all the questions this evening. The video will be posted to the West Indian Social Club um, website and I have the contact information of everyone in the um, in the chat and so I will also have that posted and I do know that I think the presentation we saw earlier I have the link to that that's also on the website so I will also share that so um, is there anything for the good before we leave okay thank you everyone I really Appreciate it. Got a lot of information. Bye. 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 Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good Bye, night. Everyone.